Hare Krishna. We have a variegated presentation tonight, I suppose, as usual. Today, we'll speak a little bit about Sri Krishna Vasanti Ras. Since according to the timetable of, or the date of Krishna's pastimes, this is the day when he enacts his springtime, Rasa Leela. It's also the day for Sri Balaram Rasa Yatra. We'll speak about those topmost jewels of bhakti later. But for now, as we've been doing, let's begin with discussing bhava, material existence, and our role in it. Some of you may have heard a concept tossed around by the media, by government leaders, by medical specialists. The concept is called herd immunity. It is said that the UK tried out this concept at first. This approach means let the COVID-19 coronavirus just burn through the population and in that way, a sufficient percentage of the population will be already over it. And their bodies will have developed antibodies to protect them from further virus attacks. Of course, as we know, the UK government reversed course because the hit by the virus was so weighty upon their medical system. Behind the scenes, this concept is discussed, but discussed in combination with doing all that's necessary to stop the virus now with the hope that until a vaccine is developed enough people will have already gotten this virus and developed immunity to it so it's kind of like a numbers game herd immunity Why am I speaking about this? Because remember, we've been discussing how material existence is a virus. It's a disease. And bhakti takes this disease on head first, attacking the problem at its root. So you may wonder, and I may wonder, is herd immunity possible in terms of our disease of material existence? Maybe if just enough people suffer from illusion, they'll become immunized. They'll say, oh, we've had enough. Maybe that's the way out of what I call mass consensual trance. Let people experience the full inferno of the illusory energy. And, and then they'll say, never again. This is a very dangerous proposition, actually. Because, as I often point out, when you are absorbed in the avijja shakti, 
the nescience potency, the illusory energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Where are you going to get your education from? You're in the ocean of avidya, ignorance. Where's the vidya, the knowledge, particularly raja vidya, the king of knowledge, as Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, raja vidya, raja guyam, the king of all education, the most secret of all secrets. There is no educational department in the illusory energy. That means a real education. What is Maya? Illusion. And also what is Maya? Krishna's mercy. Sometimes individuals, even those who have taken up the practice of bhakti think that they have to experience material life sufficiently and then they'll give it up. Actually, this argument is presented by Daksha in the sixth canto. He's talking to Narada Muni and he's about to curse Narada Muni because Narada Muni influenced so many of Daksha's sons to take up the full practice of spiritual life. So Duxia's point was that, look, Narada, I appreciate the eventual goal of self-realization. But isn't it true, don't you know, that in order to ultimately break free from the material energy, you've got to go through it first. You've got to experience it first. And then your renunciation, your dropping it will be decisive and firm and lasting. So we may become swayed consciously or unconsciously by that kind of notion. If I experience illusion, then I'll develop antibodies. I've had enough, and I won't be subject to any more attacks by the illusory energy. What do you think? This conception can actually become very grotesque. Back in the 70s, there was a very popular cheating yogi, so-called guru, who advised his followers through his books and speeches that in order to get to the higher self, you first have to burn out the lower self. So just burn it out. Do anything and everything. And then one day you'll rise up to the higher self. It's a more grotesque way of saying Experience is the best teacher. But many of you know that I often point out the forgotten second half of that mantra. Experience is the best teacher because a fool will learn no other way. The bhakti experience is all about hearing. Gaining experience through the ear. In other words, by our reading Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, and the other bhakti texts, we're actually gaining experience because these books are not just some kind of material encyclopedia. They are the presence of Krishna. And they're enriching you with knowledge, jnana, and vairagya, detachment. So this is the smart way, actually the civilized way, to get over material existence. 
take your lessons through the ear. <laughs> but again, we wonder, how is it that just by hearing, I actually get the full dynamic of experience? Again, the sound vibration of the bhakti text is not ordinary. It's not mundane. It's able to present the realities of the material world and also the experience of the spiritual world. All depends on our bhakti. So let's consider again this concept of herd immunity in relation to the real disease, the main disease, which is material existence. Will enough people decide we're over it? We don't want any more to participate in this mass consensual trance. It is possible by the global spreading of the Yuga Dharma, chanting Hare Krishna. You may recall from our discussion about the Panchatattva last week or so, wherein Adi Lila of Chaitanya Charitamrita, it is stated that by the dancing and chanting of the Panchatattva, the seed of material enjoyment in the living entities becomes impotent. So you might say, okay, the Panchatattva, they're, they're chanting, they're dancing, but <clears throat> all over the world we see that people are in mass, entranced by the illusory energy and determined to push on in it. But all over the world, you also see fortunate individuals taking shelter of bhakti through the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra. If there is a deluge, a huge rainstorm, which we do need on the upper part of the North Island in New Zealand. Uh, currently we're in drought conditions, but the weather people predict in a few days, there'll be some rain. Let's see. So if you're in a rainstorm, you carry an umbrella or you put on rain gear to protect yourself. What about others? But I don't see anyone else carrying an umbrella. I don't see anyone else putting on rain gear. But you know, I don't want to get drenched. I don't want to, and then get sick and get a cold, get a flu, get a virus. So you adequately protect yourself. And that's what the bhakti yogi does. Adequately protects himself, herself. Not simply out of selfishness, but also so that you are capable of helping others. You're capable of convincing others. Please put up your umbrella. Please put on your ring gear. So yes, the possibility is there for everyone to take shelter of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And yes, we work towards that goal. But your first obligation is to save yourself. And again, that's not selfish because only by your being healthy can you help others to be healthy. The possibility is there that the whole world can take shelter of Lord Chaitanya. The golden age of Lord Chaitanya, as you heard about, is for those who choose to take shelter. The Panchatap for their dancing. We discussed how the more the Panchatap for plunder the storehouse of love of Krishna, the more the supply increases, the more they drink of the nectar of love of Krishna, 
the more their thirst grows more, grows and grows. And by their chanting and dancing, they make it easier for conditioned souls to take the bhakti. So immunity, back to COVID-19, using it as a metaphor. The hope by the medical establishment is that if enough people get the virus and get over it, sometimes they say 80% are asymptomatic, they don't feel anything or very mild, very mildly. So if enough people have already been hit by it, but are not dead from it or devastated by it, this will build up a big segment of the population that can function in spite of the reoccurring presence of the virus until the vaccine comes. In other words, somehow the, the economy has to push on People can die from the virus. People can die from economic reasons. So some other, the normal activities of society have to push on. But the fine print is there, as always. No one knows yet if you can actually develop lifelong immunity to the coronavirus or even immunity that lasts one year. There have been other mm, viruses based on pathogens from animals. And it's it said that the immunity only lasts a few months. In other words, you can get it again. So there's a lot of uncertainty. But concerning the virus of material existence, there's no uncertainty. If we, with dedication and steadfastness, take to the bhakti process, the virus of material existence will be cured. But now you may say, but we've seen persons get reinfected with the disease of material existence. They were practicing bhakti for X amount of time and then they lost the plot one way or another through making offenses, through just inattentiveness to their daily practices. And it, well, for whatever reason, they left the path. But you see, there's always independence to use or misuse. That's something we need to become comfortable with. Persons can choose to follow the guidelines in dealing with the COVID-19 virus social distancing, washing hands, minimum 20 seconds. You can do all those things and then stop. That independence is in your hands. Similarly, you can start the process of bhakti and before you're completely cured, completely immunized, you can stop the process. But what does Narada Muni say about this in the first canto of Bhagavatam? He says, better you start and stop than never have started at all. Because even though you've started and stopped, your life will never be the same. 
and you'll have your spiritual credits in your bank account and you won't lose them. You'll start again in the future. So this is why we're so vigorously pushing on Lord Chaitanya's mission. We know that some persons aren't going to go the distance. But their spiritual credits will be eternal. Maybe they won't begin again to their next life. The next life is a fact. Some will go the distance. Some will make their life perfect. So yes, it's a great struggle. The disease of material existence is more insidious. It's more crafty and conniving, shall we say, than the coronavirus, COVID-19. We know the symptoms, however. We know the symptoms of what happens when someone contracts the disease of material existence. And yes, if enough persons take to the bhakti process throughout the world, you will see a massive change. We strive for this goal because it's the order of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who said, wherever you go, whomever you meet, teach the science of Krishna. This is the easiest way to please Krishna. This is the easiest way to attract Krishna's attention. Just like now, so many of the medical establishment, doctors, nurses, emergency crew, ambulance crew, those staffing the emergency rooms, they're getting so much attention because they're putting themselves on the line to help the suffering persons who contracted the virus and have developed very serious effects. So the media is rightfully glorifying such medical workers as heroes. Just think how Krishna sees his medical workers, those who are working to relieve conditioned souls of their most deadly disease, material existence. Sometimes people say, and sometimes our own devotees say that, well, there's so many spiritual teachers, so many spiritual paths. How do you know which way to go? Krishna addresses this in Bhagavad Gita, of course. Vitaraga Bayat Kroda. Krishna talks about becoming free from attachment, fear, and anger. And those of you who are reading Bhagavad Gita regularly know. The attachment means material attachment, not spiritual attachment. We'll talk about that more later. Material attachment. The fear means fear of a spiritual identity. That may sound funny to you or odd. Why would someone be afraid of having a spiritual identity? But I have seen statements by supposedly very learned persons who say that who would want to live eternally? It would be so boring. Let's just squeeze every moment we can now and, and that's it. <laughs> enough is enough. I would be tired of being me eternally. I've educated persons say like this. 
what they're implying, because obviously they're not very philosophical. What they're implying is that existence is just a repeat performance. It's the same old, same thing again and again. So take your share of it and there's nothing more. So why go on? Obviously, such persons don't understand the spiritual reality, which is full of unlimited variety. And the material varieties are so dim and distorted compared to the unlimited spiritual variegatedness. So they don't see that. They think, oh, look, life's been tough enough or life's been repetitive enough as it is in this body. When the body's finished, that's it. Who wants the promise of eternal life? That means eternally being bored, the same old, same old, same old. No way. Let's just end it. As we'll discuss later tonight, Krishna has his world of unlimited variegatedness. He has his unlimited associates. And he wants to give his parts and parcels the taste of unlimitedly expanding pleasure in his association. We criticize material life while at the same time glorifying the spiritual world. Both happen together. You heard what Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita about attachment and fear, but what about anger? In this particular verse, Krishna is talking about the anger we can develop, we speaking generally, talking about human beings in general, the anger that there's so many spiritual paths, so many spiritual teachers, ah, just forget the whole thing. Let me just get intoxicated. Let me just plunge into sense gratification. Who can figure all this out? No one knows. We can be sure of that. Yeah, that's right. We know that no one knows. <laughs> that much we know. No one knows anything, but we do know that thing, even though we don't know anything. This point is dealt with, believe it or not, in the first chapter of the first canon of Srimad Bhagavatam. The sages gathered at Naima Saranya spoke, questioned Sutta Goswami. They said, Burini, Buri Karmani, Shotavyani, Vibhagasaha Atat Saro Triat Sarang Samudritya Manishaya Bruhi Bajaya Bhutanam Yenatma Suprasiddhati. This is the eleventh verse of the first chapter of the first canon. They say there are many varieties of scriptures, and in all of them. There are many prescribed duties which can be learned only after many years of studying their various divisions. Therefore, O sage Sutta Goswami, please select the essence of all these scriptures and explain it for the good of all living beings that by such instruction their hearts may be fully satisfied. Where are you going to find a genuine program for full heart satisfaction? We settle for scraps in material existence, in bhava, bhava sagra, the ocean of repeated birth and death. We settle for such paltry insignificance. And for that privilege, we have to work so hard. 
not simply working in the job sense, but work in the sense of struggling. This point comes up again later in the first canto when Pritchett Maharaj is about to depart. He wants to know. <clears throat> what is the best thing to do in all circumstances? And what's the best thing to do for someone who's about to die? And as you know, those two questions are actually one. Because in all circumstances, everyone is about to die. One effect that the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic has had on the world is that everyone's conscious that death could be knocking at the door. What Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita is no longer doomsday talk. It's the omnipresent reality. Janma Mitsu Jaravyadi Dukkha Doshana Darshanam. The intelligent person sees the real problem, the real disease, that is material existence, which has different components known as birth, death, disease as conventionally known, old age. But those components are all part of the material existence package, which is a disease itself. So Pritchett Maharaj is surrounded by the greatest sages and mystics, brahmanas, sadhus from all over the universe. And he would like a unanimous answer from this extraordinary group surrounding him. He knows because his name is Bridget. That means one who sees, sees what's going on. He knows that there's some disagreement out there in the audience, even though they are the greatest sadhus and mystics and yogis in the universe some of them are stressing more karma performing good karma to go to the higher planets others are stressing jnana metaphysical speculation for merging into brahman others are stressing mystic yoga for developing mystic yoga powers and then there are the bhakti yogis who understand the pinnacle of all existence connecting to Krishna. So Prince Maharaj could see. I want to develop unanimity in this audience. He knows what to do, but... <laughs> As the chief executive, he's placing himself at the, under the guidance of the sadhus. And for our benefit, he's making this inquiry so that a unanimous decision will develop upon the arrival of Shukadeva Goswami. So all the sages, mystics, and yogis with their different slants on the on what is the ultimate goal of life couldn't come to an agreement, but in their mind they were all crying out for Shukadeva Goswami because they knew he can resolve all these different issues. So while their mind is crying out for the solution, 
They wanted a unanimous solution. They were looking down the path. On that path, Shukadev Goswami was approaching. And so they gave him the seat of honor and Bhagavatam unfolded. My point is that this hubbub about, oh, there's so many paths, there's so many teachers, so many texts, spiritual texts, it's been going on for millennia. Bhagavatam, as the pinnacle, resolves all of this. And as you know, right in the beginning of Bhagavatam, it is stated, Paramo Namatsaranam Satam. This highest yoga text is meant for those who are non-envious and are swan-like. Paramahansas, meaning they know how to extract the essence of life, just like a swan can extract milk from a mixture of milk and water. Bhagavatam is the resolution to all the confusion, debates, arguments. It deals straight on with this whole puzzle about, oh, there's so many teachers, so many books, so many past, this, that, the other. Srimad Bhagavatam talks about them all while presenting Krishna Tattva, the science of Krishna as the Supreme. Sometimes our devotees get exhausted about how to handle the coronavirus. One expert says this, another expert says that. Data is cited supporting this angle. Someone else presents data supporting another angle. It can be indeed exhausting. We can only do our best to maneuver through these dangerous times while remembering that the worst thing that can happen to us is, is if we forget Krishna and forget Krishna's service. We promised you that will speak a bit about bhava. We've talked about bhava as usual. Now it's time to venture a bit and very carefully into the world of bhava. Today is the celebration of Sri Krishna springtime ras. We know much about the autumn rasayat, but springtime is also there for Krishna's pleasure. I wanted to read to you a bit about the various seasons in Vrindavan manifesting during Krishna's Boma Lila, his earthly pastimes. So that we can all understand that the Holy Dham is all spiritual and certainly Krishna and his activities are all spiritual. We're reading from Ananda Vrindavan Champu. This is a beautiful text. We don't have a BBT version of it yet. We have kind of a rough text. So bear that in mind, please. Kind of a rough and ready text. But you'll get a good idea 
of the exquisiteness of this Shastra. Kavi Kanrapur is the son of Shivananda Singh. And when Kavi Karnapur was a babe, he would be taken to Puri, Jagannath Puri, with his father and mother to see Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And the babe, Kavi Karnapur, would suck on Mahaprabhu's toe. There was one time when Lord Chaitanya asked this little boy, Chan Hare Krishna, Chan Hare Krishna. The boy wouldn't say anything. Again and again, Mahaprabhu exhorted him, Chan Hare Krishna, Chan Hare Krishna. Boy wouldn't say anything. Mahaprabhu threw his hands up in the air. I can make the whole universe chant even lower forms of life but I can't get this little boy to chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> then Mahaprabhu's associates, his close associates explained, ah, we think we know the reason. <laughs> he is, this boy is chanting Hare Krishna in his mind. <laughs> That's Kavi Karnapur. So let's hear what he says about the seasons of Vrindavan. I think you'll find it very fascinating. The transcendental forest of Vrindavan exists beyond the reaches of time. Yet it is divided into six sections to display the six seasons. So these six seasons of Vrindavan correspond apparently to the material seasons but they're all spiritual and all these six seasons nourish Krishna's Leela. So what are those six seasons? Number one <clears throat> you have spring then you have summer and then autumn winter and something called the dewy season. That means dew covers everything. And then spring again, summer, the cycle goes like that. All the seasons are Satchitananda. So Kabi Karnapur explains that there's the, I forgot the monsoon, sorry. <laughs> After summer comes monsoon, and then autumn. That makes six. So all the seasons contribute to Krishna's pleasure. There's the joy of the monsoon, the pleasure of autumn, the satisfaction of winter, the happiness of the dewy season, the beauty of spring, and the auspicious season of summer. So in material existence, there are dualities. Maybe summer is too hot, winter is too cold, spring is too rainy. Will the monsoon come or will it not? Will it cause floods or will it not be enough and cause droughts? And But in the transcendental forest of Vrindavan, all six seasons contribute 100 percent unlimitedly to Krishna's pleasure so let's hear about the spring season partially I'm not going to go over the whole presentation but just give you a little glimpse first of all the moon the moon rays increase their brilliance. Once spring sets in and the cold of winter has departed. Remember, winter is satisfying. <laughs> There's no duality. 
in Krishna's all-perfect spiritual pastimes. Pleasure is blissful and pain is also blissful. <laughs> Heat is blissful. Cold is blissful. These are all just different varieties. Different ways of pleasing Krishna. And Krishna is always surrounded by his devotees. So the moon rays increase their brilliance. while the springtime moon shines sweetly in the sky above. Down below, the young gopis enjoy sweet pastimes in the kunja in the groves of Vrindavan. The breezes blow and carry sweet fragrances from grove to grove. Kunja to Kunja. So the gopis come to gather flowers. What about Krishna? Krishna is attracted by the beauty of the unlimited flowers. Wearing a gold necklace, he takes such delight in seeing the gopis in their prime of youth. Now here's a part that especially sticks out in my mind. It's about the humming bees. So many of these bees, there's so many of them that they darken the sky as they speed towards the flowers because the bees want the pollen in these super fragrant flowers. But then what happens? The bees are making a beeline, it seems, to the flowers. And then something else happens. So much so that the lotus flowers that the bees are supposed to head for, the lotus flowers are wondering among themselves. Why, why haven't you come all the way? Why haven't you landed on us? Drink. Each lotus flower is presenting itself. Drink from me first. What have we lotus flowers done? You haven't come. Have we committed some offense to you bees? What's happened? What happened to that beeline? So many bees darkening the sky, speeding toward the flowers. The flowers are offering their pollen to the bees, but now the bees are ignoring the flowers. Why? They've become intoxicated by smelling the fragrance from the lotus mouth of the Brajagopis, whose hearts overflow with intense feelings of love. Meanwhile, what else is happening in the forest? The best of the maddened elephants roams about. Who is that? Govinda. The one who gives pleasure to the cows and the senses. He's compared here to the best of the maddened elephants. He's roaming about with the intoxicated gopis of Brudge. Who are always whispering, but their sweet whispering defeats the soothing sound of running water in the streams. Isn't that beautiful? This is springtime for Krishna and his associates. Some more factual information about the six seasons of Vrindavan. Remember, spring, summer, monsoon, autumn, winter, and dewy season. Six distinct seasons manifest in Vrindavan. In six specific forests. One forest for each of those six seasons. 
but they're 10 season forest types. Why is that when there's six seasons and there's one forest for one type of forest, excuse me, Krishna's playground is unlimited. There's one forest type for each season, but there, there are also forests that have two seasons appearing as a pair, as autumn and winter, dewy and spring, and summer and monsoon. So Cubby Connor points out that in this way, Brindavan features nine types of seasonal forests. But actually, the final amount is 10. Because in the 10th type of forest, all six seasons occur at once. <laughs> so what happens in that 10th type? in which all six seasons combine. The young gopis take fresh kadamba flowers from the rainy season and fix them in their hair parts. And then in their petal-like fingers, they twirl autumn seasonal lotuses. On their cheeks, they smear the pollen of winter flowers. And around their necks, they put flowers from the dewy season. They get a shoke buds from the spring and put them over their ears. And from the summer season, they entwine malika garlands in their hair. Why do they do all this? To worship their beloved Lord Krishna. As Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami explains in Chaitanya Charitamrita, however the gopis beautify themselves, dressing, jewelry, etc., it's 100% done only for Krishna's pleasure. They're thinking, when Krishna sees us, he'll enjoy. And by Krishna enjoying their beauty, they enjoy even though they're not at all trying for their own happiness. This is one of my favorite parts of Chaitanya Charitamrita, where Srila Prabhupada explains that this is paradoxical. Krishna's dear most devotees are only thinking of Krishna's pleasure 100%. Not in the slightest do they think of their own pleasure. Still, though, Krishna forces pleasure upon them. This is the paradox of pure love of Krishna. So all their decorations in this special forest, which has all six seasons happening at once. It's very interesting because they're taking the best from each season in this forest and decorating themselves with that. So what about Krishna's Rasa Leela? Let's talk about some tattva. We don't want to make the mistake of confusing Krishna's loving affairs with the pathetic attempts that go on in the material world. Pathetic because of the lack of full satisfaction and also pathetic because old age, disease, and death spoil it all. But when you hear about Krishna and his associates, you're hearing about what is real. And when we strive for our 
unsatisfying and temporary affairs. We're dealing with a perverted reflection, as you've heard so many times. The first verse of chapter 29 of the 10th canto sets the pace, so to speak. Shri Badaraya Nilvacha Bhagavan Apitaratri Sharadot Palamalika Vikshrantumanas Chakre Yogamayam Upasrita. So this verse, the opening of the five chapters on Rasalila. Sets the scene. Shukadeva Goswami explains. Bhagavan Apitaratri. Krishna is Bhagavan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That means he is perfect and complete in himself. So this point is firmly established from the very beginning. Just like we explained, Bhagavatam firmly establishes at the very beginning what its audience is. What's the proper here of Srimad Bhagavatam? So in the 10th canto, we've reached the smiling face of Krishna in the 10th canto. Shukadeva Goswami says, number one, he's Bhagavan, full of all opulence. Yet, he looks at the autumn night and he stimulated. Those of you who have studied nectar devotion know about Udipanas. Stimulants for ecstatic love. Those stimulants are in full operation by the arrangement of Yoga Maya, Krishna's pastime energy. Yoga Maya also means, the Acharyas point out, the energy that fosters yoga, connection, the love supreme. So what are those stimulants? You have Shadadotpala Malika, the flowers, jasmine flowers, scenting the air with their fragrance. You'll hear about the moon. Having a reddish hue as it rises. The breezes blowing. All these factors make Krishna think and conclude. Because Vigsharantum Manas Chakra, he's observing, he's doing an environmental scan, we might say. <laughs> and he's concluded, this is the night. Hmm. His pastime energy has arranged for it all. So Shukadeva Goswami explains, Shri Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, full in all opulences. Yet, upon seeing those autumn nights scented with blossoming jasmine flowers, he turned his mind toward loving affairs. To fulfill his purposes, he employed his internal potency. He's always self-sufficient. He doesn't go outside of himself. He's consorting with his consorts. Everything and everyone is Krishna's energy. The Acharyas raise the point. How do you expect Krishna to be in his boyhood without tasting supreme loving affairs? 
Rupa Goswami states, Kaishoram Sapali Karoti Kalayan Kunje Beharam Hari. Lord Hari perfects his youth by arranging loving pastimes in the groves of the Vrindavan forest. All the things we love to do and fail at or just get a temporary glimpse of in our lives, Krishna does unlimitedly and perfectly. So how can you deny loving affairs in Krishna? What in this world of perversion is so absorbing and so demanding, we say, no, it's not there in the supreme absolute truth. Jiva Goswami points out that the main reason for Krishna doing all these activities is to give happiness to his devotees, to fulfill their desires. These perfect devotees want to drink the honey of Krishna's beautiful face. Krishna wants to give them happiness. He's self-sufficient. He wants to come under the control of his devotees. Once we understand this, we can start to appreciate the depth of Rasa Lila. But first we have to have at least that understanding. His flute playing played a special music which the gopis understood was directed at them, announcing what the program for the night would be. On this occasion, the acharyas point out, Krishna took special use of his akarshini flute. He has different types of flutes. But this akarshini flute was what he chose for stealing the hearts and minds of the gopis from the village out into the forest. This is all about special prem caused by the Hadini Shakti, Krishna's internal pleasure potency. You're not talking about material lusty enjoyment. And by hearing of these activities, of the Ladini Shakti, Krishna's pleasure potency, in arranging, staging the Rasalila, we can become free from material lusty enjoyment. Bhakti is, through its preliminary and developed stages, preparing us for this ultimate medicine. I've often explained how someone can have a disease and the cure is available, but in order to take that cure, they first have to build up their system so they can handle the ultimate medicine. So this is what the nine cantos of Srimad Bhagavatam do. They build up your system so that in no way will we make the mistake of thinking Krishna's pastimes are ordinary or material. In no way would we ever dare to think to imitate such leelas. We want to conclude tonight with a question Pritchett Maharaj asks. Because as the seer, as the observer, he's so expert. 
in the audience. Now, we've already gone through nine cantos worth. We're deep into the tenth canto. Still, Pritchard Maharaj is checking out the audience of the sadhus, sages, and yogis all around him. And he's he has observed uh, some of these prabhus think that this is material. They don't understand Krishna's Rasalila. Let me pose a question to Shukadeva Goswami on behalf of those who have doubts, because I see doubts in the audience. He had noticed the expressions on the faces of some of the yogis, sadhus, brahmanas. They were reacting like, hmm, this is a bit dubious. Supreme Absolute Truth dancing in the middle of the night with young girls. Hmm. Some of them were leaning in the direction of Brahman realization. Qualityless Brahman. Activityless Brahman. And what is this about Krishna's qualities and activities as the ultimate? To resolve the doubts of such persons, Pritchard Marge asks a question to Shukadeva Goswami. This is verse 12 of chapter 29. Sri Pradikshiru Vacha Krishnam Vidu Param Kantam Natu Brahmataya Mune Guna Pravaho Paramas Tasam Guna Diam Katang. Sri Pritchard said, O oh, sage, Shukadeva Goswami, the gopis knew Krishna only as their lover, not as the supreme absolute truth. So how could these girls, their minds caught up in the waves of the modes of nature, free themselves from material attachment? So his words are meant for external persons. They're not thinking. These gopis, he's referring to by his words, the gopis are not thinking of Krishna as the supreme absolute truth. They're thinking of him as their most dear lover. So how can you get free from the modes of material nature? Just that kind of consciousness. Does that mean, in other words, that you can meditate on any person and you'll get free from material nature? You'll get liberated? Richard Maharaj had all this in mind by his asking this question. Skillful Mayavadis and Persilists would say, okay, they're meditating on Krishna as Brahman and they'll become free from material nature just as we could meditate on anyone because everyone is Brahman and we can meditate on anyone and become free from material existence. Of course, Krishna is Bada Brahman. <laughs> we, share his, we share qualitative equality with him but not quantitative. The gopis were overwhelmed by Krishna's qualities. Pritchard Maharaj, on behalf of the doubters, is saying, but they don't think of him as the supreme. So how are they going to get out of material existence? How will Bhavasagra be destroyed for them? Their minds are absorbed in his beauty, his sweetness. His skill at loving affairs. How are they going to attain liberation? How does Shukadeva Goswami handle this? 
through Preacher Maharaj, he chastises the doubters in the audience. He says, didn't I already explain this to you? In the discussion in the seventh canto about Shishupal, Shishupal hated Krishna, yet he achieved perfection. So why can't those who are 100% in love with Krishna achieve perfection? Shukadeva Goswami is making a pretense of scolding Bridget Maharaj, although he understands this is not your question. Should Shapal attain liberation of, through hatred of the Lord? Well, then what do you expect the gopis are going to get with their pure love? So then, in the next verse, Shukadeva Goswami gives his encapsulated uh, description, or presentation, rather, of Krishna Tattva, the science of Krishna. Nrinam nishreya sattaya vyaktir bhagavato nirpa aviyasya prameyasya Nirgunasya Gunatmanaha. The Supreme Lord is inexhaustible, O King, and immeasurable. He's untouched by the material modes because he is their controller. His personal appearance in this world is meant for bestowing the highest benefit on humanity. Avyayasya, inexhaustible. He can satisfy unlimited devotees. Aprameyasya, immeasurable. All while being near Gunasya. The material qualities can't touch him because he is Gunatmana. He's the controller of the material modes. So this is Shukade Goswami separating Krishna from the ranks of tiny living entities. And pointing out that if even demons killed personally by Krishna attain liberation, what do you expect that the pure lovers of Krishna get? This is a very fascinating meditation for us to end the night with. Please remember those seasons in Vrindavan, the spring season, the different types of farce, remember 10 types, the bees that are making a beeline, bzzz, for the lotus flowers in the springtime. So many bees are in flight heading toward those lotus flowers that the sky is darkened. But they divert. What happened? The lotus flowers themselves are wondering, why aren't you taking our pollen? Come to us, come, come. But the bees have been diverted, attracted by the honey-like fragrances coming from the mouths of Krishna's dearest devotees. All right. So I thank you all for your kind presence. And we look forward to seeing you Friday night 
for our next Sangha. Hare Krishna.